Hey, anybody else get stressed out by that survey? Raise your hand. I was stressed out. I got to the preaching question. And I was like, I'm strengthened by the preaching at Center Church. Uh, you know, like, do I put five? Is that proud? Will God strike me with lightning? Anyway, thank you guys for being good sports. That's really gonna help us uh, hopefully lead the church well in 2024. So thanks for bearing with us. If you're new, welcome. We don't give you a scantron every time we come, okay? Just on the first Sunday of Advent. Uh, but hey, we're glad that you're here. Let me ask you a question. Do you know what a mission trip is? Like if you grew up in church, maybe, like maybe say, so yeah, I know, I know what a mission trip is, but maybe you didn't grow up in a mission trip. And so let me try to ex explain to you what it is. Uh, it's when you travel long distance and you embed yourself in a new culture to share the hope of eternal life there, right? So, so maybe you do that by digging a well or building a home or hosting a sports camp, but that's basically what you're doing on a, on a mission trip. You're going a long distance to a new culture to share the hope of eternal life. Um, well, guys, that's what Jesus did 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem. Have you ever thought about it that way? Jesus traveled the immeasurably long distance between heaven and earth. It was so long, he had to connect through Atlanta, guys. He did. Okay, and he embedded in a new culture. Was it new for Jesus to be the child of two impoverished teenage parents? Was that a new cultural experience? It was. Why did he do it? So that the world could have the hope of eternal life. You see, rightly understood, Christmas was the first and the longest Christian mission trip. Christmas was the first and the longest Christmas, uh, Christian mission trip, which is why this December, we are talking about the mission of God. It's why this December, we're gonna talk about the mission of God. And then on December 24th, we're gonna host Christmas Eve services so that you and your friends can hear about the grace of God, okay? So we're really excited about that. Man, but we're also collecting a year-end missions offering, 100% of which is gonna go to kind of four different ministry buckets, okay? And if you've been around for a while, you know what we call it. We call it the hold the rope offering, Okay, the hold the rope offering. Now, why do we call it the hold the rope offering? Well, it comes from the story of a man named William Carey. Okay, William Carey is a very famous missionary. He's worth reading about sometime. And years and years ago, William Carey decided, I'm gonna go to India to share the hope of the gospel with people there. Now, nowadays, when you go to India as a missionary, it's a big deal. We actually have two of our members in India as missionaries right now. What do you do? Well, you say goodbye to your family and friends. You get on a plane for 20 plus hours. Man, you, you land on the ground. You text everybody to say, hey, we made it. Pray for us. This is a lot. But guys, that's, that's not how it worked when William Carey went. When William Carey went, you didn't get on a plane for 20 hours. You got on a boat for several months. And many missionaries packed their caskets with them because they just recognized, I'll probably never be back here. So William Carey was a little bit scared. Would you be a little bit scared? I'd be a little bit scared. William Carey was a little bit scared of going to India. So he said to his best friend, a pastor named Andrew Fuller, he said, um, Andrew, going to India feels like going down into a deep, dark well. He says, it's, it's scary, it's overwhelming. He said, but I'm willing to go down if you will hold my rope. <sighs> He basically said, look, I'm willing to go to India, India if you'll stay here in England and you'll raise money for me and you'll raise prayer support for me and you'll write me letters and you'll remind me that it matters and you won't abandon me. If you'll hold my rope, then I will go down into the well. And sure enough, William Carey did and Andrew Fuller spent the rest of his life raising awareness and raising funds for William Carey's ministry and it made a massive impact in India and really was the beginning of the modern missions movement. So here's what we wanna do this December. We wanna hold the rope for four ministry partners that we're connected to. Man, we wanna just bless them and put wind in their sails financially and say, we want you to go further faster because you are connected to our church, okay? So we've got four buckets that we're gonna, that we're gonna give to you. The first is LifeSpring Pregnancy Center. So they're a ministry here in town that offers uh, no cost, no judgment, uh, medical care to women experiencing unexpected pregnancy. And so they advocate for life that way. So we're gonna support them. The second bucket is our, is our residency program here internally. It's the main way that we invest in the leaders of tomorrow today. And so this offering is gonna allow us to expand that residency and bless our residents that are in it. Uh, the third bucket is gonna be Catalyst Church. So Catalyst Church is a church plant in Newport News, Virginia, just a few blocks for Christopher Newport University. Man, and they are trying to do there what we are trying to do here in Charlottesville. And so Pastor Daniel Tripp is gonna be here next week to share about what God is doing at Catalyst. We're gonna get behind them. And then our last bucket is gonna be the, get this guys, five members of our church that are living as full-time international missionaries around the world. Think about that. Five members of our church. That's about one for every 100 people that come here. I think that's worth clapping for that are overseas serving in some of the hardest, most unreached, most needed places in the world. And we just wanna come alongside them and bless them and care for them and put wind in their sails, okay? So you're gonna get to meet and hear from many of those partners in the month of December. And here's the ask right up front, 100% participation. 
That's what we're after. We want every person who calls this church home to make a one-time gift over and above normal tithes and offerings to the Hold the Rope initiative so that we can bless our ministry partners and we can put wind in their sails and courage in their hearts, okay? You can do that in person on December 17th in our service, or you can do that online through the end of December at centerseville.com forward slash hold the rope. Last year, we raised $50,000 for mission that we just gave away. Man, my hope and my eager expectation is that we would far exceed that number this year, but it's gonna take all of us, man, going before the Lord and saying, Lord, this is worth it, and I wanna be about your mission this December, okay? So that's what we're gonna be talking a lot about in the month of December. I'm really excited about it. You're gonna get to meet those partners. Let's pray for Hold the Rope and pray for our partners and then jump into our text for today. Let's pray. God, thank you that you're a God of mission, that you didn't leave us in darkness, but you came and became the light of the world. And I just pray that this December, you would sharpen our vision of the importance of mission and you'd help us to love and to support our missionaries well. We love you, Lord. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen, amen. Well, if you have a Bible, you can meet me in Acts chapter one, starting in verse one. Acts chapter one, starting in verse one. We're going to talk about the mission of God because as I said, rightly understood, Christmas was a mission trip. Now, to put it more specifically, Christmas was when Jesus began his mission trip, and Acts chapter one is when Jesus ended his mission trip. We're gonna look today, guys, at the last words Jesus ever said. The last words that Jesus said to his disciples on earth, that's what we are going to look at today. But you might be here and you might be like, Josh, come on, man, it's December. Can't we talk about shepherds and angels and mangers and the wise men? Like, why, why can't we talk about that? Well, the reason that we're not talking about that is because we need a vision and understanding of Christmas that is substantive and hopeful. Substantive and hopeful. Let me explain. I love the Christmas season. I really do. I'm into all the things, right? I'm not not a hater. But can't we all just admit that our cultural understanding of Christmas is a bit superficial? Like it's a bit shallow. I mean, we have this like hallmark picture of everyone sitting around the fireplace in their matching onesie pajamas, you know, like drinking hot chocolate and laughing, right? But, but here's what we know, man, our lives hardly ever look like that, right? If, if you're here and you're in a season of waiting or of suffering or of grief, man, our cultural understanding of Christmas can be crushing because here's the reality. Christmas this year might just be another year that you're single, Christmas this year might just be like another year that you, you don't have kids and you guys, you guys thought that you would. Man, this might be your first Christmas divorced. It might be your first Christmas without mom or without grandma. Your life may not fit into a Hallmark movie. So what we need is a vision and understanding of Christmas that transcends sort of the, the cultural glittery version of Christmas and is, the, is more rooted and more significant. And that's what the Bible gives us. Because guys, the the Bible says that Christmas isn't about sentiment and nostalgia, it's about the character of God. It's a beautiful reminder that we serve a God who at great cost to himself came into the world to save us from our sin and now invites us to join him in his global mission. That is an understanding of Christmas that can anchor you no matter what your circumstances are like. And so what we're gonna do this December is we're just gonna talk about who God is, man, why he cares about his mission and how we can be a part of it. And we're gonna start by looking at Jesus's final words, like I told you, to his disciples in Acts chapter one. And we're gonna learn how we can participate in the mission of God today, this Christmas season, okay? Look at verse one with me. It says this, in the first book, O Theophilus, Theophilus is the man that that this book was addressed to. I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering, that is his crucifixion, by many proofs, that's by much evidence, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Now, when it says first book, when he's referring to his first book, that refers to the gospel of Luke. You see, Luke and Acts are a two-part set. They were both written by a medical doctor named Luke who was a traveling companion of the apostle Paul. And in Acts chapter one, we're dropping into a 40-day period following Christ's crucifixion, but before Christ's ascension. This is a very important time in the history of the church because it was during this period that Jesus presented himself to his disciples and to his church as alive, historically and objectively. See what Luke says, by many convincing proofs. How did Jesus do that? Well, he, he ate meals with his disciples. 
He, he cooked meals for his disciples. He said to Thomas, come and put your finger in my scars and stop doubting, but believe. First Corinthians 15 tells us that Jesus appeared to over 500 witnesses at one time. And he did this over a 40 day period. Why did he do all of this? Because some religions are based on subjective ideas and intuition, but Christianity, on the other hand, is built on the claim that real events transpired in history and they call for a response. And so Luke is kind of dropping us into this very important period between the crucifixion and the resurrection. Verse four, and while staying with them, he ordered them, that's very strong, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Jesus told his disciples not to leave the city until they received the promise of the Holy Spirit. Why was this such a big deal? Because things were about to change. You see, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon individuals for a limited amount of time to accomplish a specific purpose. But through the work of Jesus Christ, everything was about to change. Theologians call this the institution of the new covenant. And in the new covenant, the Holy Spirit doesn't fall on individuals for a limited amount of time, but the Holy Spirit comes to indwell the people of God and never leaves. And so Jesus says, guys, a massive shift is about to happen. You're gonna need this to accomplish my purposes. And so wait here until it does. Verse six, so when they had come together, they, the disciples asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They were thinking about the political kingdom of Israel. Are you gonna restore us to our days of glory under the king, under King Solomon? And Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the father has fixed by his own authority. You see, the disciples were confused about the nature of the kingdom of God. They thought it was going to come politically and they thought it was going to come immediately. Okay, they thought Jesus was going to set up a kingdom and reign over a political empire and they thought he was gonna do it right now. You see what he says? They're like, is now the moment? Like, okay, you conquered death, you fed 5,000, you walked on water, you command demons, certainly you can deal with Rome. Is, is this the moment? Like, are you about to set up our political kingdom? And Jesus has to correct them. You see, the kingdom of God does not come immediately and the kingdom of God does not come politically. The a good way to understand the kingdom of God, it is, it is the rule and reign of Christ in the hearts of people. So how does the kingdom of God come? Well, it comes incrementally as we make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. Man, as more and more people bow their knee to Jesus Christ and his rule and reign comes over their heart, the kingdom of God expands. It doesn't happen immediately, it doesn't happen politically, it happens incrementally and it happens spiritually. And so Jesus says, guys, you're confused. You don't need to worry about when God the Father is going to consummate the kingdom, but I'll tell you what you do need to worry about. Verse eight, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. <clears throat> that word but is important. Here's what Jesus is saying. The consummation of the kingdom is the Father's business. That's what, he, that's what he's gonna worry about, but this is your business. So here's the question that you need to be asking. Here's what you need to be focusing on. Jesus says, your business is to bear witness to me, to bear witness to me. He says, you're going to receive power from the Holy Spirit. And here's what I want you to do with that incredible power. I don't want you to set up a political kingdom. What I want you to do is I want you to bear witness to me locally. That's Jerusalem and Judea. Nationally, that's Samaria. And globally, that's the ends of the earth. Verse nine. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. That is the ascension of Jesus Christ, which means verse eight contains the very last words that Jesus spoke to his disciples while he was on earth. And guys, last words by their very nature are meant to be lasting words. The more important the person, the more weighty the words. So these are the very last words of the resurrected, triumphant king of the universe. So what did, what did he say? Well, he could, he could have reminded his disciples about the importance of loving their neighbors. That'd be, that'd be a good thing, that's important. He could have summarized the Sermon on the Mount. Hey guys, just remember, I know it was a lot, but here's five points in a poem, okay, here it is. This is what you're supposed to be preaching. He, he could have told them about the, the trouble that was on the horizon. Like, hey guys, I want you to be prepared. Things are gonna get hard, hang in there. Of all the things that Jesus could have said in his perfect wisdom and in his perfect attentionality, he decided to remind his disciples of their mission. Guys, these words inform our divine assignment until Jesus returns. Not to be too heavy handed here, but when you stand before Jesus, he's gonna ask you how witnessing went. 
And if you're like, oh, I didn't know I was gonna do that. He's gonna be like, what? What? How did you misinterpret that? Like the last thing I said was, this is what I want you to do, but you've spent your time doing a bunch of other things. Like it's gonna be on the final exam and he's being very clear about our responsibility. Jesus said, I want the entire world to hear about this good news. That because of what I've done, because of my atoning death, they have hope. And no matter who they are or what they've done, they can be saved and transformed and brought into the family of God. I want everyone around the world to know that. And you are the means by which that's going to happen. You're gonna be empowered to go and bear witness all over the world to my name. You see, in verse nine, Jesus's mission trip ended and our mission trip began. And if the world is going to know about the hope of the gospel, it's because we, the church, bear witness to who Jesus is and what he has done locally, nationally, and globally. And so what I wanna do is I wanna just draw out three principles for bearing witness that we see in this passage. Three principles for bearing witness that will help you right now bear witness and that will help you in the future bear witness. Here's number one. Guys, witnessing requires supernatural empowerment. Witnessing requires supernatural empowerment. If you look back at verse four, Jesus says something very, very strong. He commanded them not to leave Jerusalem until they received the Holy Spirit. Now, why did he command them so strongly? Because you know there are some type A disciples. You know what I'm talking about? They're like, all right, here's the plan. Philip, you've got Jerusalem. Okay, Stephen, you go to Samaria. We need to host a conference. Peter, start writing a book. You know what I'm talking about? Like some of you are that disciple. You know, you're like, we're gonna do this, let's go. Right, and yet Jesus says, look, I'm telling you, this is so important, I forbid you to leave the city until this happens. The point Jesus is making is that you will never be able to accomplish this mission that I'm giving you apart from supernatural empowerment. But why Jerusalem? Like why, I mean, none of them were from Jerusalem and Jerusalem was the place where all the people who just killed Jesus were. So do you think you'd wanna be in Jerusalem? I'd be like, I'm gonna go visit my parents. You know, like I'll be down in Galilee if you need me right now. So why Jerusalem? Because Jerusalem is where the temple was. And guys, all throughout the Old Testament, the temple was the place that God's power and presence dwelt. But here's what Jesus is saying. Because of the remarkable work that I've done, everything's about to change. You are about to become a temple. You see, in the old covenant, the power and presence of God dwelt in buildings, but in the new covenant, the power and presence of God dwells in believers. This is a massive shift in redemptive history. Jesus is saying, I'm going to fill you with my very presence and my very power. And guys, here's why that is so important. Because you can be moral, you can be religious, and you can be conservative without the Holy Spirit. But you cannot be a Christian without the Holy Spirit. And there's a lot of confusion in our culture today about the difference between being moral and traditional and conservative and religious and being a Christian. They're radically different things. You can be the first one in your own strength. You can only be the second one in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus is saying. That is why it is so important. It was so important to the early church that Jesus says, I forbid you to leave Jerusalem until you receive the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you, is the Holy Spirit that important in your life? When was the last time that you asked God the Father to fill you with the Holy Spirit? Is there anything that you're doing right now that will 100% fail if the Holy Spirit doesn't empower you? What role does the Holy Spirit play in your life? Guys, you simply cannot live a fruitful life and you cannot be an effective witness without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus is saying. Now, if you're here and you're from more of like a charismatic or Pentecostal background, you're like, finally, (laughs) right? You've got the purse open. We're grabbing the tambourine and the anointing oil, baby. You know, like get that, spritz that thing going, right? You're like, finally, I've been waiting for this, right? Um, If you're more like Baptist, Presbyterian, Catholic background, you're like, is this church about to get weird? You know, like, like what's about to happen, okay? And that's because two reasons. Number one, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what the Bible teaches about the Spirit. And to be honest, there's a lot of people who, who call things the Holy Spirit that are not the Holy Spirit, okay? So let me just try to teach you what the Bible says. Let me tell you, sometimes people are like, are you Baptist? Are you charismatic? I'm like, I just teach what the Bible says, okay? So maybe I'm like baptomatic. I don't know what that means. Okay, but I just try to say, this is what Justin likes that. Uh, this, is, this is what the scriptures say. All right, let me just walk you through what the scriptures say. Number one, the scriptures say that the only way you can become a Christian is if the Holy Spirit comes into your life. That's the only way. 
You're, we're, we're too dead in our sin, we're too deceived, we're too darkened spiritually to want God at all without the Holy Spirit. So if you're here and you're a Christian, it's because the Holy Spirit came into your life and the New Testament says that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That you are baptized at the moment of conversion, the Holy Spirit comes into your life and you can never lose him, praise God. But the New Testament also talks about what's called being filled with the Holy Spirit. And these are two distinct ideas. There's being baptized by the Holy Spirit, and then there's being filled. To be filled in the Holy Spirit means to walk in the power of God. To, to walk in the power of the Spirit so that you are doing what God calls you to do. It, it, it's, a, it's a supernatural empowerment for you to push through awkwardness and for you to push through fear and for you to push through lethargy, man, and, and to be alive to the mission of God in the world and be alive to who he is. Unless you think like, Josh, you're just making this up. Let me give you some, some references here. Acts chapter four, verse eight. This is after the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit enabled Peter to testify about Jesus before the Sanhedrin. Some really, really intimidating guys. Let me ask you, have you ever needed courage to testify about Jesus before someone you were intimidated by? Probably do, right? Okay, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, just like Peter did. How about this? Acts 4.23, the church is scared by the political developments of the city. And so they prayed and the Holy Spirit filled them with boldness to go on following Jesus no matter what happened. Do you need that? Do you need, do you need to be anchored? Do you need some courage in the midst of the world that's going crazy to be like, okay, God is good. He's on his throne. I'm gonna keep following him. That's what the disciples needed. Acts 13, 52, the Holy Spirit filled the disciples and enabled them to be joyful in the midst of suffering. You need that? Anybody here naturally joyful in suffering? I'm not. Anybody here ever seen a follower of Jesus be joyful in suffering? It's a powerful witness. I know people who've come to faith in Christ because they watched a coworker suffer with joy. That's what the Holy Spirit enabled the disciples to do. And then Ephesians 5.18, this is what Paul said. Do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. The verb that Paul uses there indicates continuous action. So it would be translated something like this. Be continually being filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, Paul's, Paul's admonition to us is that we should always be seeking the filling of the Holy Spirit because we always need him. And unless we get confused about like what it means or what it feels like to be filled with the Holy Spirit, here's a simple definition. Being filled with the Holy Spirit simply means to be filled with supernatural strength to do what God has commanded. That's all it means, to be filled with supernatural strength to do what God has commanded. It has different signs. You can look through the book of Acts and it looks very differently. Sometimes it's really dramatic. Sometimes it's very normal. It's simply being filled with supernatural power to do what God has commanded. Guys, it's essential to living a fruitful Christian life and it's absolutely essential to bearing witness to Christ. So here's the question, how can you be filled with the Spirit? Practically speaking, how can you, if you're a Christian here today, how can you be filled with the Spirit? Well, let me give you, let me give you three ways, okay? Number one, come to our night of worship and prayer tonight. You're like, that's bold. Well, the reason we do a night of worship and prayer is because we're like, we can't do this on our own so we're gonna spend an hour and 15 minutes together worshiping God, praying and asking him to strengthen us. I can't think of a better way to invite the Holy Spirit to fill your life. Okay, so 4.30, be here. No promises, but it's a pretty good bet, okay? Like, like be here, man, it's gonna be powerful. Guys, man can build a crowd, but only the Holy Spirit can build a church. And so we wanna be a church that's filled and led by the Spirit. So that's why we do things like nights of worship and prayer, okay? Here's number two, make room for the Spirit. Make room for the Spirit. Um, D.L. Moody was a famous evangelist. He said this, if we are full of pride and self-conceit, ambition and self-seeking, pleasure and the world, there is no room for the Spirit of God. Before we pray that God would fill us, I believe we ought to pray that he would empty us. That's a convicting question to ask. I didn't say it, Deal Moody did. Like, man, is, is there some area in my life that the Spirit's like, I'd love to be in that room of this house, but you've got the door locked. And it's like, man, I wanna walk with you, God. I wanna feel your presence more. And God's like, well, we need to talk about generosity, but you won't talk with me about it. Or we need to talk about sexuality, but you won't talk with me about it. Or we, or we need to talk about being committed to a local church body, but you won't talk with me about it. And so we're sort of at a standstill because I wanna go in that room, but you've got it locked. And so I'm just gonna sort of sit here until you open, open that door, right? Is there an area that you need to make some room for the Holy Spirit? And, and here's the third one. This is really simple. Ask the Father to fill you. Ask the Father to fill you. I love Luke chapter 11. Jesus finishes Luke chapter 11 by saying this way. If you then who are evil, that's a fun little smack, right? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Let me ask you, who here likes to give their kids Christmas gifts? Anybody? 
I love giving my kids Christmas gifts and I'm evil. I am. But I even like giving my kids Christmas gifts. You know that joy of giving your kids Christmas gifts? Jesus is saying, look, if you love giving your kids gifts, how much more does your perfect heavenly father love giving the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And so here's, here's the question. Have you ever done that? Have you ever asked God to fill you with the spirit? Just said, Father, I need your spirit to strengthen me. I need you to illuminate the words of scripture in my mind and in my heart. I need you to give me courage to bear witness. I, I need you to help me to forgive. I need you to help me to break this addiction or break this behavior. And I can't do it on my own. Lord, would you fill me with your Holy Spirit to do it? Man, God loves to answer those prayers. God loves to answer those prayers. So the question is, have you ever asked God to fill you with the Holy Spirit? Not just like once in the past, but in a continuous way. If you, let me, let me just say, if you're killing it right now at witnessing, don't worry about it. Okay, so like if you're just killing it at witnessing, leading everybody to Christ and you need no help with this, you're good, don't worry about the sermon. But if you're like me and you're not killing it and you need some help, man, this is, this is absolutely essential for us to understand. The only way that we can do what Jesus called us to do is if we're empowered by the power that Jesus promised to give. Okay, so number one, witnessing requires supernatural power. Here's number two, witnessing involves personal responsibility. Witnessing involves personal responsibility. Back in verse eight, Jesus said, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses to the end of the earth. The means by which the gospel goes forward into the world is through the witness of individual Christians. That means if you are a disciple of Jesus, you are called to bear witness to Jesus. If you are a disciple of Jesus, you raise your hand and say, yes, I've surrendered to him, I'm a Christian, congratulations, you are called to bear witness to Jesus. Uh, Rodney Stark is a sociologist who wrote a book called The Rise of Christianity. And he explored the question, why did Christianity grow so fast? Why did Christianity grow so fast through the first three centuries of its existence? And he was asking it from a sociological perspective, not from a spiritual perspective. And one of the things he found was this, that every single believer considered it their personal responsibility to multiply. The first three centuries of the church, every single believer understood that if I'm a follower of Jesus, I'm called to bear witness to Jesus. They didn't consider evangelism and disciple making to be the work of a special elite class that had education and giftings. They understood it to be the responsibility and the, and the privilege of every follower of Christ. It's a good question to ask. Do you believe that? Do you believe that you personally are called to bear witness to Christ? Or do you consider it someone else's responsibility? Somebody with a different personality than you, somebody with more education than you, somebody that's in an easier set of circumstances than you? Do you consider it your responsibility to bear witness or do you consider it someone else's responsibility to bear witness? Guys, honestly, this is hard to say, but honestly, if the early church treated the Great Commission like many of us do, the gospel would never have gotten here. We wouldn't be here today. The only reason the gospel got here was because a whole bunch of men and women at cost to themselves with great faith said this matters and we're going to carry it forward. Um, this week at my missional community, we were talking about areas uh, that we had become lukewarm. Jose did a great job last week. Can we give Jose a big round of applause, guys? Yes. Just the man, love him, love him, love him. Did a great job. Anyway, so we were talking about areas that, that we had become lukewarm and I just had to confess, like witnessing is an area that, that I've become lukewarm. So like when we first planted the church, man, I was on fire. Like I was praying, I mean, literally praying by name. I, had a, I made a map. I was praying by name for like every person in my neighborhood. And uh, man, like taking personal risks to share the gospel, pressing through awkwardness because I, I really believed it was, it was worth it. Um, and over the years, I, I feel like I've just like kind of slid into, into lukewarmness. And I, and I and man, I was really convicted by that, especially preparing this message because it's not like Jesus was unclear and, and that's a big problem, guys, because as goes the pastor, usually goes the church. The most evangelistic churches are usually led by the most evangelistic pastors. So let me admit something to you that I'm not proud to admit. I, I wish this wasn't true. Um, our church is growing very rapidly, like 55 to 60% over last year. But our rate of baptism is lower per capita than it used to be. We're not baptizing as many people per capita as we did in the early days. Even though we're, you know, this room's packed and we're growing and we're adding a service. Why is that? Well, I mean, it could be a lot of reasons. But I think one of the most likely reasons is we've just kind of lost our evangelistic fervor, right? We've kind of believed the lie that bearing witness is someone else's responsibility and, and someone else will get to it. 
And so, and so here's what I'm doing. I'm just repenting publicly. And I'm dealing with this in my own life. Man, and over the next, man, 12 and 18 months, we're gonna try to, man, equip you and inspire you and encourage you, man, to, to be a witness in the places that God has given you to be a witness. And so the question is, if you're resolved to do it, and you're like, I wanna be a witness, what, what do I actually do, Josh? Like, what do I bear witness to? Well, let me give you at least two things that we see in the book of Acts constantly. The first is you bear witness to the historic evidence of the resurrection, okay? You bear witness to the historic evidence of the resurrection. What you've gotta understand about the early church is they did not go out preaching what they believed. They didn't. They went out preaching what they had seen and heard and touched. They didn't consider themselves gurus. They constantly referred to themselves as witnesses. You see the difference? You see, many religions are based on intuition and human speculation. Well, I think this and you think that, and you can spend a lot of time talking back and forth with people about, well, what do you think? And what's your truth? And what's my truth? But that's never what Christians have said. Christians have always built their faith on historic claims. That Jesus didn't just rise from the dead metaphorically or, or in our hearts, but that he actually rose from the dead. He spent 40 days with his disciples, proving to them, like, I'm really here. Guys, Christianity and reason are not in opposition to one another. Man, Christianity is built on on historic claims. And so one of the best things that you can do with your family or friends is help them see the difference between Christianity and all the other worldviews out there that are just built on speculation and ideas and intuition. You can just say, no, like, let's just investigate the evidence of Christianity. Because if the resurrection really happened, man, that changes everything. And now I kind of, I need to just submit my life to everything Jesus said, right? But if the resurrection didn't happen, well, then I can just get rid of all of it. A great way to do this, there's a little book called The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. It's a great accessible book that you could read with a family member, with a coworker. Actually, Jose, who preached last week, came to faith in Christ when he was 17 because somebody read The Case for Christ with him, helped him understand the historic evidence. Okay, so the first thing you bear witness to is the historic re- re- uh, evidence of the resurrection. Here's the second thing you bear witness to, the difference Jesus has made in your life. The difference Jesus has made in your life The king of the personal testimony in Acts is the apostle Paul. I mean, he does it like three or four times. We know so much about his story because he shared it so many times to substantiate the claims that he was making. He would proclaim that Jesus rose from the dead and is able to transform lives. And then he would say, and let me tell you what he's done in my life. I was full of pride. I was full of anger. I was full of hatred. I was persecuting and killing Christians. And now I am a radically different person. He would share what Jesus had done in his life to substantiate the claims that he made. And guys, when you share your personal testimony with those that you know, with your friends and family and coworkers, it substantiates the spiritual claims that you're making. But only if, you ready? Only if you share the PG-13 version of your testimony. You know what I'm talking about? You know that version. The version like, I don't really wanna tell that version. Can I tell you what is not a powerful narrative that won't move me to action? You ready? I was always a pretty good person. And then after college, I decided it was time for me to get back in church. Wah, wah, you know, like, like I am not moved by that. Like, number one, you weren't a very good person or you don't understand Christianity. Uh, number two, that like maximizes you and minimizes Jesus. No one is responding to that narrative, right? They're just not. You know what it is, a powerful narrative? Your actual testimony. You're PG-13, maybe R, maybe mature, like wouldn't let my kids watch this on Netflix, that testimony. When you, in humility and authenticity, will look at people around you and say, guys, I was self-consumed. Like not in a pretty way. Like I was conceited. I didn't care about anyone. I, I used women. Like I just wanted their bodies. And so I would manipulate them to get what, what I wanted. I loved money. I cared way more about money than I did people. I was addicted to pornography. I was enslaved to what people thought about me and I changed what I said and how I acted to keep other people happy with me. I was in bondage to an eating disorder and I was an alcoholic. I lived a double life. I felt crushed by my shame and by my guilt. And then I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news that God saves sinners. And I repented and I trusted in Christ and God has saved me. And I'm not a finished product, but I'm also not the man that I once was. Come on, that's a true story. And that's a powerful story. Your PG-13 testimony is powerful. Your G-rated testimony is garbage. It's not even true. Church is not just a place where a bunch of good people who don't need a lot of help come together to sing some songs. 
Man, church is a collection of depraved, black-hearted sinners who are in bondage, who are not good people, who Jesus loves so much that he saved and cleansed by his blood and has given a new power and a new testimony to. Man, that'll move some people. That'll have your coworkers and your cousins and your aunts and uncles being like, man, something is different in them. So who needs to hear your PG-13 testimony this Christmas? Scary, isn't it? You know who I think really needs to hear it? Your kids. Your kids need to hear it. Do you know why? Because if you never share your actual testimony with your kids, here's what they're going to assume. Mom and dad have always been good people, so I better be a good person or else God won't love me. You know what your kids need to hear from you? The same thing I've told my kids. And it was a little bit awkward. I said, guys, here's what I did in college. I made bad decisions, I got drunk, and I participated in sexual behavior that I'm not proud of. And it's a little bit awkward, but do you know why I told them that? So that when they go to college, two things happen. Number one, when they're tempted to do all the same things I did, I hope they're like, dad told me about this and he regrets it, so maybe I shouldn't do this. Number two, I hope that if they do make the same mistakes that I did, you know what they remember? Man, dad did this and God saved dad and God loves dad and God is changing dad, I bet he can change me too. Guys, your kids don't need your PG testimony. Your kids need your PG-13, your R-rated, your real testimony because it's powerful and it glorifies God. All right, so number two, witnessing involves personal responsibility and sometimes it's uncomfortable. All right, here's number three. We're called to witness to people unlike us. We're called to witness to people unlike us. There's something in verse eight um, that is lost on most of us, but would not have been lost on the first people who read this, okay? And here's what it is. Um, you have to understand that everyone Jesus was talking to was Jewish, all of them, <laughs> okay? Like Jesus was Jewish, 100% Jewish. He did the vast majority of his ministry among Jewish people. He died and he rose again in the Jewish capital city, Jerusalem, and he was the fulfillment of all the Jewish messianic prophecies, all right? He was thoroughly Jewish. Everybody is talking to Jewish. So when Jesus gets up and says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea, that made sense to everybody because that's where Jews lived. But when he said Samaria and the ends of the earth, it was shocking. Here's why, guys. The Jews hated the Gentiles and the Gentiles hated the Jews. Like, not like didn't like them, hated each other. There's not even really a good modern comparison. Imagine like the most right-wing conservative person you know and the most left-wing progressive person that you know and then multiply it by like 10. And that's, that was the situation between the Jews and the Gentiles. And here's, here's Jesus saying, those are the people that I want you to go and witness to. What you have to understand is when Jesus sent them to those people, he sent them to people that were unlike them and whom they did not like. It's not just they were different than them, they didn't like them. They were like, we, we don't like those people, we don't talk to those people, we don't interact with those people, I wish those people were gone. And yet Jesus said, this is your mission. Now if he ask you, who do you need to witness to that is unlike you and you might not like? Who do you need to witness to who is unlike you and who you may not like? Um, maybe he's a mansplainer, you know what I'm talking about? And he's always like explaining things as kind of something, you're like, I understand cars, okay? Like you don't need to, Right? And you don't really want, you, you just find him arrogant and a jerk, you don't really want to witness to him. Um, maybe she's just really abrasive. And it's like, ah, man, I just feel like it's just, I, uh, it's so hard to be around her to have these conversations. Um, maybe you're old and she's young and you're like, ah, we're not gonna be able to relate about anything. Uh, maybe you're black and he's white. Maybe they're wealthy and you're not. Uh, maybe you're, you know, progressive and they're conservative. Maybe you guys watch different news channels, gasp. <laughs> oh, right? Right? Who is unlike you in your life that you need to be a witness to? Maybe they're at work. Gosh, it's December, right? Maybe it's that aunt, you know what I'm talking about? Um, here's what I think is funny. Maybe it's that person that drives you crazy because they refuse to say the word Christmas because they find it offensive. And you're just like, are you kidding me? Or maybe it's that person who has the magnet that says, keep Christ in Christmas. You know, it's like both sides. We got both groups in here, you know? It's like, we just got people we don't like and people that are not like us. And yet what Jesus is saying is, guys, we're called to go and share the gospel with those people. And guys, here's the bottom line. If the early church had only shared the gospel with people who were like them, none of us would be here because we're all Gentiles, right? We are not the Jews. The only reason that we have hope is that thanks be to God, Jesus Christ is a global Messiah. He's a global Messiah who isn't, who isn't kind of boxed into one particular culture or ethnicity, but he is the savior of the entire world. 
Guys, they were called to witness to people who were unlike them and who they didn't like, and we are called to witness to people who are unlike us and who we maybe don't like. The spirit of Christmas is missional. It absolutely is. And when we fix our eyes on what Jesus did for us, man, it transforms us. It transforms our hearts and it creates in us a desire to share the good news with others. You see, the early church was effective as witnesses to Jesus Christ because they were captured by the gospel message. Are you captured by the gospel message? Man, this is what they believed with all of their hearts because they had seen it and experienced. Their conviction was that Jesus was not another religious prophet. He wasn't one more man or one more woman telling you what you need to do to please God, but he came on a rescue operation to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. The gospel is good news, friends. It is not good advice about how you can make yourself a better person. The church believed he wasn't just another religious prophet. The church believed that, man, we crucified Jesus. That when God came to earth, we're such a rebellious traitor race that we would rather crucify him than to submit to what God Said. But in the greatest irony the universe has ever known, our murder of Jesus became the payment through which we could be forgiven by Jesus. That God turned it on its head if we would repent and believe. The church believed that the baby who was born in the manger, man, grew up to be the man who died on the cross and was the savior who rose from the grave. Not because it was likely not because it was expected, but because they'd seen it and experienced it. They understood that if this was true, it was the greatest act of grace ever imagined. God, the creator, dying for us, his rebellious creation. And they understood that if this was true, it was the most important message in the world because it is the only hope of salvation for man around the world. You see, on Christmas, we remember that Jesus was born in a manger so that one day he could die on a cross to provide salvation for people who are utterly undeserving. And it's remembering the remarkable grace of God that empowers you to bear witness to the people around you. And so what I wanna do is I just wanna invite you to bow your heads. I wanna invite you to just take up a posture of prayer. And here's the question. Who do you need to be a witness to? Who do you need to tell about Jesus Christ and the good news that Jesus Christ loves and Jesus Christ saves sinners? Is it a family member or friend? Maybe a coworker, a neighbor, a classmate? I'm gonna give you just a few seconds here to get a person in your mind and in your heart. And then I'm just gonna pray that the Holy Spirit would fill us and empower us to bear witness. That person in your mind and heart. I've got mine. Holy Father, you are worthy of praise. You're worthy of the worship of every single tribe and nation and tongue and through the work of Jesus Christ, that is possible. But God, in your wisdom, you've decided that we are the means by which the good news goes forth. God, I know across this room, there are hundreds and hundreds of people on our hearts and minds that don't know the good news of the gospel or separated from you, but could be saved. And you want us to be a witness to them. So Lord, I'm asking right now that you would fill me and that you would fill this congregation with your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come and fill us with boldness. Come and fill us with courage. Give us eyes to see the opportunities in front of us. Give us courage to take them. And Lord, do a supernatural work in the lives of those around us that the words that we share with them would not just be human words, but they would be words of divine power that tear down strongholds. Lord, remove blinders from people's eyes, open up ears, soften hearts that we might see the waters of our baptismal stirred, that we might see men and women become brothers and sisters of Christ. We might see generational patterns of sin broken. We might see new destinies forged. Holy Spirit, fill us, fill me, fill this church and help us to be witnesses to the name of Christ in our lives. Lord, we love you, we need you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.